Well, my friends and teachers and members of the AFT, I feel I'm coming home. As Randy mentioned, I was a very dear personal friend of Al Shanker. Sandy Fellman was a dear personal friend. Randy Weingarten is a dear personal friend. And I want to say all of us owe Randy a tremendous debt of thanks for her tireless, fearless work these past two years. As the forces of anti-unionism, as the people beating up on teachers got more and more intense, she's been out there engaging in hand-to-hand, -hand, face to face combat with the most virulent enemies of public education and of teachers. Thank you, Randy. Well, I'm almost willing to bet that I've met almost everybody in this room because over the past couple of years, I have spoken to you in New York City, in Chicago, <laughs> in Los Angeles, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Boston, Miami, Detroit, New Haven, Providence, Houston, Hartford, and many, many other cities. And I have a confession to make. When I go to bed at night, I often wear a nightshirt that says, with us, not to us, Hartford Federation of Teachers. I thank you, Hartford, for the nightshirt. AFT has been in the forefront of the struggle for public education, for professionalism, and for protecting the middle class. But today, the beliefs of the American Federation of Teachers are challenged as never before. Public education is under attack by the forces of privatization, by people who make false promises to drain students and funding away from public schools, and in some states, they're bankrupting public education by draining students and funds away. The teaching profession is under attack by those who blame teachers for conditions beyond their control. They want to take away your professionalism and turn you into testing technicians. The public schools are under attack by those who heedlessly slash your budgets, increase class size, and reduce essential services for children. The teachers' unions are under attack. You're under attack for one simple reason. You defend public education. You defend the rights of children. You stand in the way of the budget cutters. You fight privatization. You oppose high-stakes testing. If they take away teachers' rights to bargain collectively, they silence your voice. They eliminate the one force that can stop them. That leaves the path clear for them to cut funding to turn more public schools over to non-union charter chains, to introduce for-profit online charter schools, to double class sizes, and to implement policies that hurt children and reduce the quality of education. You must not let them do it. Today, Today, you face a political juggernaut that calls itself the reform movement. They corrupt the plain face meaning of the word reform. The reformers say that American education is failing. They say that it's obsolete. They say that we spend more and that achievement is flat. They want to persuade the public to abandon their public schools. They're laying the groundwork for privatization. They claim that our schools are in an unprecedented crisis. They say this again and again. It's a big lie. They are wrong. There is only one valid longitudinal measure of academic achievement for America's students as a whole, and that is the Federal National Assessment of Educational Progress. NAEP. NAEP is a no-stakes test, and this is what it shows. The test scores of American students are at their highest point in history. The test scores of white students, black students, Hispanic students, and Asian students are at their highest point ever in fourth grade, in eighth grade, in math, and in reading. 
The increases in reading have been steady and significant, and the increases in math have been very large. The increases have been greatest for black students and Hispanic students. Reformers will never admit these simple facts, but they are facts. They are a matter of record. We should be thanking our nation's teachers for this steady improvement, but reformers don't do that. Instead, they keep up a steady drumbeat of criticism. They say that teacher experience doesn't matter. They say that teachers should not be paid more for getting a master's degree. Well, I don't get it. How will American education improve if teachers have less experience and less education? The reformers believe in evaluating teachers predominantly by student test scores, but test scores are not a valid way to determine which teachers are best and worst. Firing teachers is not a school improvement strategy. Firing teachers creates turmoil and churn and instability and makes the profession itself unattractive to prospective teachers. In city, in city after city, experienced teachers have been laid off and replaced by poorly trained, inexperienced teachers who will be gone in two or three years. This is wrong. Our children, our children need and deserve experienced teachers, and parents want them too. Our children need stability. So do schools. The reformers believe in closing schools. Reformers call it creative destruction. They're right, it is destruction, but there's nothing creative about it. What they don't understand is that public schools are embedded in communities. They don't understand that killing a neighborhood school is like putting a knife into the heart of a community. That's wrong. The reformers take no responsibility for helping schools. That's too hard. That's not their job. They don't know how to help schools, so they close them. They open new ones and hope for the best. They forget public schools or public institutions. They're not shoe stores. They don't open and close on a dime. They don't understand that struggling schools enroll the students with the greatest needs. Those schools need help, not firings and closings. Reformers like to talk about school turnaround. They love the idea of a turnaround. It's such a sweet euphemism. It sounds a little bit like a happy dance around a maypole, doesn't it? We're all gonna go out and do a turnaround. The reality is brutal. Half the staff is fired, even if not a one of them has had a negative evaluation. The community loses its school. A new staff is brought in, and five years from now, if nothing else changes, that school will close too. This is madness. The AFT has stood tall against high-stakes testing. High-stakes testing is diverting billions of dollars that should be used to reduce class size and improve instruction. Tests should be used for information. Tests should be used to diagnose the needs of children and to help teachers as well as children, not to close schools, not to fire teachers. Because of high stakes testing, our schools are cutting down on the arts and physical education, on history and science and foreign languages and civics. They're laying off librarians and guidance counselors and social workers and nurses. Some are even eliminating kindergarten. This is insane. The reformers like to say that merit pay will compel teachers to raise test scores, as if you aren't trying now. What you need to know is that merit pay has been tried again and again and again for 100 years. It's never worked. It doesn't work because it undermines teamwork and collaboration.
Merit pay destroys the culture of the school, and the evidence is clear. But just this past week, a new study came out. This new study says that if you give teachers extra money at the beginning of the year and threaten to take it away, then the scores will go up. This is called loss aversion. This is not merit pay. It's manipulative and it's sadistic. I bet the scores will go up if you threaten to cut off teachers' fingers <laughs> or to confiscate their homes. That'll work too. Loss aversion insults the dignity of teachers. I wonder, would doctors save more lives if we threatened to take away their pay? Would economists make better predictions about the economy if we threatened to close down and take away their computers? Reformers say that they can judge the quality of a teacher by the test scores of students. This is wrong. No high-performing nation in the world is doing this. We're leading the way in the wrong direction. Value-added assessment should never be used to fire teachers or to award bonuses. The National Academy of Education and the American Educational Research Association issued a joint statement earlier this year in which they said that value-added assessment is inaccurate, unreliable, and unstable. The teacher who is ranked effective this year is likely to be ineffective next year, and vice versa. If you use a different test, if you use a different model, the ratings will change. Test scores are influenced more by the student's family than by the child's teachers. The scores are affected, the scores are affected by children's lives, by the, their opportunities, by their daily crises, by the vocabulary they hear, by their out-of-school activities, all of which are beyond the teacher's control. Value-added assessment used as it is today is junk science. Your job, your reputation, and your career should not depend on such an unreliable and unstable a measure. The single biggest predictor of test scores is family income. The single most reliable predictor of low academic achievement is poverty. The United States leads the advanced nations of the world in child poverty. We are number one. Nearly one quarter of the children in this country grow up in poverty. In other highly developed nations, the child poverty rate is under 5%. This is the shame of our nation. But the reformers say, don't talk about poverty. Don't talk about children who are homeless. Don't talk about children who are sick and hungry. Don't talk about children who have asthma or vision problems or hearing problems or need dental care. Don't talk about that. They say, you're just making excuses. Well, I disagree. We must talk about poverty. We must ask why the world's richest, most powerful nation looks away from the needs of its children and allows so many to be hungry and homeless and sick. Let's talk about what schools and children need. They don't need more testing. They need more education. They need experienced teachers. They need early childhood education. Young mothers need good prenatal care. Children need, children need a full and balanced curriculum. They need one that includes the arts. Yeah. 
in history, in civics, in foreign languages, in literature, in science, in mathematics. They need physical education every day. Children need time to sing and dance and play. They need band and chorus and drama and dance. They need the time to read great books and to do science experiments. If the, if the reformers really want to fix our schools, they should open a health clinic in every school that doesn't have one. They would, they would be amazed by the improved academic performance of children who come to school healthy and ready to learn. What do professionals need? Professionals need to do their work without fear. They need to know that their school is not in danger of being closed because of test scores. They need to know that they have the academic freedom to teach about evolution and to assign books that deal with controversial issues. They need to know that they will be evaluated by supervisors who are master teachers, not by principals who took a one-year course on how to be a principal. Professionals, professionals, professionals need to work in a professional atmosphere where they are treated with respect and dignity and where they have the resources and support they need. <laughs> Policymakers should stop dreaming up schemes based on carrots and sticks. Carrots and sticks are for donkeys, not professionals. We know what motivates professionals. Professionals work hard because they believe in the mission. Professionals work hard because they want to make a difference in the lives of children. Professionals want to collaborate. They don't want to compete for prizes. Now, despite all the dark clouds, and there are plenty of them, there are reasons for hope. The United Federation of Teachers fought Mayor Bloomberg's determination to fire thousands of teachers in 24 schools, and they won. They beat the city, they beat the city of New York in binding arbitration, and when the city refused to accept the ruling of binding arbitration, the UFT beat the city again before a judge. And here's the best part. It took the judge seven minutes to make a decision. Congratulations, UFT. Another reason for hope. The Chicago Teachers Union scored a stunning victory. The Chicago Teachers Union, the Chicago Teachers Union beat Mayor Rahm Emanuel. The 
CTU brought 10,000 members into the streets. 98% of its members voted to authorize the strike. They passed a law saying that you can't strike unless you get a 75% vote, and they said CTU can never do it, and they got 98%. The mayor blinked and they won. Way to go, CTU. The United Teachers of Los Angeles has resisted pressure to evaluate teachers by invalid measures. Billionaires have launched a lawsuit against UTLA, and UTLA, UTLA has said no and no and no. Stay strong, UTLA. But that's not all. That's not all. Earlier this spring, Florida parents and teachers joined to defeat the parent trigger law. They recognized, they recognized that the purpose of the parent trigger law was to trick unsuspecting parents into turning more public schools over to the charter chains, especially the for-profit charter chains. I call this the parent tricker law. And then in Louisiana, which has just passed the most right-wing legislation ever passed in America about education, the teachers and school boards have joined to sue the state to block the use of public funds for religious and private schools. In North Carolina, the school boards of the state went to court and stopped the K-12 Corporation from opening a for-profit online charter school that would have taken millions of dollars away from the public schools of that state. And more than half the public school boards in the state of Texas have passed resolutions against high-stake testing. Remember, Texas is where all this craziness started, and this is where it's going to stop. Other school... Other school boards across the nation are following the lead of the Texas school boards. We cannot allow right-wing governors and legislatures to dismantle our public schools and to harass our hardworking, dedicated teachers. We cannot allow billionaires and corporate executives and Wall Street hedge fund managers to privatize and control our public schools. This this terrible time will end. There are cycles of history. Bad things don't last forever. Bad ideas eventually are exposed. And when this era does end, as it will, you will be there to celebrate the collapse of this reign of error. Be proud of your profession. Be proud of the work that you do. Be proud of your union. Insist on the importance of public education in a democratic society with doors open to all, not by lottery, but by right. <laughs> Insist upon the dignity of your profession. Join forces with parents who are your greatest allies. Join with principals, with administrators, with school board members. Invite your local civic and business leaders to visit your classrooms and to join you in stopping the Walmartization of public education. In numbers, there is strength. Keep your union strong. You will persist. Your cause is just, and you will win. Thank you.